Yeah, I'm Charlotte. Um, my son is Lucas and he has citral anemia. So um, Lucas was born full term. He was, I had a very healthy pregnancy with him. He was um, overdue, so I was induced. So he was quite a big baby. He was 10 pound two. And everyone said how healthy he looked and how, you know, he looks like a, a strong baby, that kind of thing. Um, then when he was about two, so he, I was trying to breastfeed him um, and it just wasn't going very well. Um, we were, he was having trouble latching. He was, um, he was very, very sleepy as well, very sleepy. Um, and I was told that, you know, this is quite normal for babies. He was also vomiting a bit as well. So he was vomiting quite a lot of like clear fluid. And I was told that that was basically, it, take, it took him a long time to, to come out. It took me two hours to push. Um, so I was told that that was because of that. Um, he was just full of fluid from that. And that was all that was. So that wasn't anything to worry about either. Um, he um, was getting more and more sleepy as the, as time went on as well. So um, I was putting him to the breast and he was just kind of laying there, not really, not latching, just kind of laying at the breast, not really trying to do anything. Um, it it been, it'd been about two days of this at this point. So we were still in hospital. Um, they hadn't sent us home because we, we weren't feeding very well. Um, and at that point, I said, I'm, look, I'm not very happy with, with how he is. Um, he's very sleepy and he's just not really responded to very much. Um, I took him, I got one of the midwives to come and have a little look at him. And they did his blood sugar and said that that was fine. Um, they said that he was a bit cold. He had a low temperature. So they said, just wrap him up, um, swaddle him, keep trying with the breastfeed and see how you go. Um, I'd had I'd had a little bit of um, colostrum I was able to express into a syringe and I fed him that and they said that obviously his blood sugar was fine so he must still be full up from that and I was thinking he's had 0.6 mils of colostrum three hours ago he wasn't still full up they were that they were saying that he wasn't sleepy he was settled he was content and I'm thinking I don't that doesn't sit right with me I don't think he is so then um, I think I gave it another hour after that and I said look he's still I just really I'm not happy with him he's, he's still really sleepy and I'm just I don't I'm not very happy with how he's presenting so then I took him to the midwife station again and the, a doctor came and assessed him that time um, assessed his like how he looked um, his breathing all of that kind of stuff and something obviously triggered a red flag because she said I'm not happy with how he's presented either and I'm, we're going to take him over to NICU now because I'm, I'm not happy with him. I think he was breathing quite fast at that point. Um, I couldn't tell you the specifics but he was breathing very fast. Um, I think he still had a low temperature as well. Uh, so they took him over to NICU um, and then at that point um, I think they were thinking maybe some sort of infection possibly something like meningitis but they weren't entirely sure they the, the, I remember saying to the nurse is he going to be okay is my baby going to die and they said no no it's going to be absolutely fine she said look at me look at my face do I look worried I'm fine look at everyone else no one's worried if we look worried that's when you need to worry I was like okay that's fine reassured me quite a bit um they were doing all the tests. They were obviously at this point, I'm really upset. First time mum, new mum, my baby's in an incubator, you know, didn't know what was going on. They were like, it's okay, everything's gonna be all right. Um, why don't you go and get a bit of rest? Cause it's been a long, you know, couple of days. Go and go around, get a bit of rest. Um, and then if anything does change, we'll call you back. So we go, okay, okay we'll, we'll do that. So we, we went to go get some sleep. This is probably about 10, 11 o'clock at night. And then they came and got us at about four o'clock in the morning and they said something's changed and he's having seizures now. Um, you need to come and see him. So we went round, we went to see him. Um, at this point, he had um, the probes under his scalp um, and they were showing us on the monitor and they said he is just having constant seizures at the moment. Um, we, don't, we still don't know what's wrong. Um, we've done every blood test. His infection markers aren't high. We don't know. We don't know what's going on here. He's got a really low temperature, um, but he was sweating 
profusely. I said, oh, his, his blanket's wet around him. He was on a blanket in the incubator and it was like, you could see the wet patch around him. And they said, yeah, that's about the fifth one that we've changed now because he's just sweating through all of them. No one knew what was going on. No one knew anything really. At this point they were still testing, still doing all their tests, but they, they just didn't know what was going on. They said about doing a lumbar puncture because they thought it might be meningitis. Um, even though the infection markers weren't high, they still, they were just, you know, grasping at straws. They just didn't know what was going on, basically. A um, few hours later, we kind of, because before this, we decided we weren't going to tell our family what was going on until we knew what was happening. In my head, we were going to call the, our family up and go, he had a bit of an infection, but he's okay now don't panic that was what we were good that was what we were we don't want to panic anyone unnecessarily um and then uh that morning so we got woken up about four or five o'clock in the morning but getting later in the morning we decided i think i think we need to start telling people so we spoke to my mum she lives in norfolk and we got her to come down because we thought we we're going to need a bit of like someone to kind of go between home and here because i think we might be here for a couple of days um, still didn't realise kind of the, the full extent of it. Um, and then it was while she was driving down that someone came up to us and said um, that they, they first mentioned ammonia at that point. That was in the morning. Um, and they said, uh, the, the doctor that told, spoke to us said that um, they'd run an, a, an ammonia test and the, his ammonia was high. I had no idea what his ammonia was. I had no idea what, I didn't, know anything about it at this point um, and neither did the doctor that was talking to me really she kind of said um, I don't really know what this means um, it means that he probably has some sort of metabolic condition but I don't know what one I don't know anything about it really she told us that some children with metabolic conditions die some children with metabolic conditions survive and some children with metabolic conditions are severely disabled that was that was the extent of what she told us basically we we had absolutely no idea i was I, she said something about amino acids she said something about ammonia but it was all very like jumbled didn't really know what was going on i still don't know exactly which doctor it was that kind of made, made the call to do the ammonia test at that point um but yeah whoever it was obviously saved his life so is thank them, thank them very much um but yeah I, I still don't know exactly who it was that made that call um because i don't think it was the doctor that spoke to us because she didn't seem to understand much about it because it was the consultant that spoke to us um but yeah so at that point um they said that he needs to get to um the evelina the children's uh, children's hospital in london um because he would need um like dialysis she explained it was like dialysis the hemo filtration um, she said he needs to get to the Evelina to have this procedure done uh, because they have the machines there. Um, she said that, so he needs the transfer. They said, we're just not sure he's going to survive the transfer. Um, so, but he needs to go basically because there aren't, there isn't any other choice. Um, so we, I think it was fairly early, like mid morning that they decided that they decided to try and organise the transfer. And it came early afternoon. Um, by that time, we'd kind of got all of our family down to our local hospital, to the NICU there. Um, and yeah, they they had to transfer him from one incubator to the other. I know that that was very touch and go um, because obviously they had to take his ventilator out and all that kind of stuff, move the equipment over. Um, and then just before we were, um, they were ready to move him to the into the ambulance. That we went into. They so they told us you need to come in, and basically they said you need to give him a kiss before we go. And I kind of afterwards, I didn't realise at the moment at the moment what was happening, but it, afterwards I kind of realised that they'd said we don't think he's going to make the transfer. They thought that was going to be our last opportunity to give him a kiss, basically. So, yeah, so the um, at that point, I kind of looked around at all the nurses and all the doctors and the nurses were crying. And, um, you know, and I, I kind of remember what the nurse before the night before had said to me. And she was like, you know, if we look worried, then you should worry. And I'm looking around the nurses and they're crying and and everyone looks like so panicked. And I was like, oh, my God, this is really serious. Um, 
I mean, obviously, I realised before that point. I think it hit me at that at that moment that how serious it was. Um, so then they um, we took him into the they took him into the ambulance. Um, he was in a it's like an intensive care ambulance. So they transfer like the critically ill children in. Um, so they uh, and then he got us to the Evelina um, in like record time. Broke all the speed limits to get us there. Um, and I, I remember being in the back of the ambulance and thinking, if we can get there and he's still alive, then I think we might have a chance. But so that that journey, that whole journey was just spent willing him to stay alive for the journey. Um, but I think I don't think anyone expected him to survive that journey because we were told several times that he might not. Um, I remember they had like shots of adrenaline kind of on the sides and they were flying off as we were you know, going around corners and stuff like that. So yeah, the, the journey was quite a, a, a difficult one. And then, uh, yeah, we got to the Evelina and then took him up to the intensive care there. Um, and then he, we met, that's when we met his um, consultant, Dr. Lamont, who's a, a metabolic consultant at the Evelina. And he's, um, I kind of say he's, he saved Lucas's life, that man, I, I, I owe him everything. Um, he uh, took us into a side room and he was the first person that was able to sit us down and go, I know what's going on. This is what's happening. And it was such a relief because everyone up until that point was very much like, he's got high ammonia, but I don't know what that means. You know, he's, his ammonia levels are really high, but, you know, we don't know why. And, you know, we don't know what condition he might have. And he basically sat us down and went, right, he's got high ammonia. That means that he's potentially he's probably got a urea cycle disorder. And that's what this, that's what this is. And he was able to really explain to us you know, really um, in a way that we could understand in that moment what was happening. And I really, really appreciate that so much. Um, the highest Lucas's ammonia got was 1400. Um, so it was obviously very, very high. Um, and Dr. Lamont told us at that point, because it was anything over a thousand, there's basically a 50-50 chance of survival. Um, and obviously there's going to be brain damage that comes along with that as well. Um, he also told us that um, he needed to have the hemofiltration done, but obviously that means a very is a very big needle that goes into the vein in the neck to to have that done. And because Lucas was a baby and he was so small, she so said that there is a risk that that needle is just going to tear through that vein. And if it is, because it's such a main main artery, he he might just bleed out as well. So we had to give consent for that to be done. Obviously, difficult thing to do, but we didn't really have a choice. Luckily, the PICU doctors at the Evelyn are absolutely amazing. And so he, yeah, he went on the hemofiltration and everything went in the right direction after that. His ammonia kind of came down. Um, he was on like full life support at this point. And they were kind of saying to us, like, he's on the maximum dose of every medication we can possibly give him. And if he doesn't stay stable, there is nowhere else for us to go with this. So we just need to hope that he stays stable and then kind of we can wean it off him. And luckily that is what happened. Um, and he um, started to wake up, started to open his eyes, able to take him off the ventilator, able to start tube feeds, um, take him off his TPN, that kind of thing. So after, you know, after he was on the, the hemofiltration, that was really the turning point. And that's when it all kind of, um, it all started to improve slowly. Um, I do think that it, once he was in NICU, if the ammonia test had been done earlier, it might not have got as high as it was. Um, because obviously by the time he went to the Evelina, it we'd been, I think it was about 24 hours after we'd gone, by the time he started the hemofiltration, it was 24 hours after we'd been in NICU. And I think if, we, if we'd gone into NICU, done the initial tests and done the ammonia test as part of that initial testing, his ammonia would have still been high, but it wouldn't have been quite as high and it yeah. might not have had such a long term impact on him. Because Lucas now is um, he's nonverbal, he's partially tube fed, um, he can walk independently, but he is um, physically delayed as well. Um, he's five now, nearly six, um, and he can't walk downstairs and he can't walk upstairs and he can't jump or run or, you know, climb and those kind of things. He can walk. Uh, he's got quite low tone though so he gets tired really quickly and we do have to use a wheelchair with him as well um like i say he's non-verbal um, he has an intellectual disability as well and he goes to a special school um he's recently been diagnosed with autism as well 
um, like I say, he's tube fed. He can he can eat, but because of a lot of his sensory needs, um, he he doesn't eat very much. I um, mean, he's been tube fed since he since he came out of hospital, basically. Um, so, although I don't necessarily think that earlier testing would have prevented all of that, I do think it would have it would have helped a lot with with some of those things. Um, so, I, if 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 children are presenting as a an unknown. I do think that ammonia should be thought of as a uh, one of the things that they need to check. Um, if you know you, you've got your initial list of tests that you need to do, your infection markers, all those kind of things. If those are all clear, the next line there should be ammonia should be on that list. The next kind of line of investigations, um, although it is rare, it's not impossible, um, and I'm you know my son is proof of that. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-